quite soon and that we have the other two sites we're working on proposals in relation to those. So I suppose what we're trying to do is to uh, bring such a model to fruition. But, but what, Thank, what no, hold on a second, please. To be fair, there are eight other people who, who have offered, and I want to be fair to all members. And we can do additional questions after everybody's had an opportunity. Deputy O'Sullivan, Maureen O'Sullivan. Thank you very much. Um, going back to the first one, uh, just to clarify, Dick, you said 22,000 sites with planning permission and then 4,000 under construction. Is that 4,000 within that 22 sites with planning permission, or are they, it is? Okay, so my first question is, looking at Dublin City Council housing list, has Dublin City Council got the capacity, or what will it take, um, whether it's in partnership with, public, with the private partnership, private developers, to clear that housing list? I know it's a very broad question. And it brings in then the Docklands and the SDZ. And the fact that, you know, the 10%, while there's no buyout, the 10% is extremely low. And I know what you're talking about in your previous answer there. And I know um, the dangers of ghettoisation, um, but 10% is extremely low. Um, and is there something, recommendation from here, that can go, that that has to be, should be increased? Um, we know down in the Docklands there's going to be an awful lot of office business type development and some of the accommodation that will be built will be for those to attract employees in so I just make a plea for people who need um, not so much somewhere to rent for work but people who need somewhere place to live. Uh, the second one is on the voids and I know progress is being made but there are still unacceptable levels of voids and I'm talking about Dublin Central there. Um, two things, one is about the clearing out of perfectly good accommodation and we know that this is costing an awful lot and it's taking time. So can, we, can that be looked at? Now, I know somebody coming in, they want their own whatever, but we do know that there's really, really good accommodation being gutted, um, which I think is a waste of time and a waste of money. To turn around the voids quicker, have you, got, have you actually got the manpower and woman power to do that? Especially as the minister did say on one occasion that money was no object in relation to the voids. <clears throat> on the modular, the cost, um, when we were down in the site in East Wall, you know, it was extremely reasonable cost. But those costs have been added to um, considerably, I think, in certain places. And again, what, what can be done about that? And on the homeless issue, um, the average time on the list is getting longer. We know that. Um, the 50 per cent that goes to homeless lists, are you going to look at that again? Because it's having, you know, the law of unintended consequences on those who have been waiting really, really long times on the other list. Um, I do know that sometimes people are recommended from the homeless list and they're not acceptable to the particular housing body because of their chaotic lifestyle in act, very active addiction. And I know that that has held up um, places being offered because it has to go on that homeless list. So can there not be a bit more give and take or a bit more leeway between the two of them? Um, people will say they don't want to go into hostels because of the risky behaviour. And we've had the conversation before, Cahal, about the drug-free accommodation. But I've been in quite a number of the hostels. I've met the staff and um, I've checked about the kind of training that they do. So what are the levels of unacceptable behaviour that's going on that people are saying that it's not safe to go into hostels. So that'll do in this round. Thank you, Deputy. Um, we'll start at the, uh, I suppose, the, the voids. Dublin City Council at the moment has a void rate of 0.79, which is um, extremely low. I think in a, in a normal operating uh, environment you'd be looking at somewhere between three and six percent. Um, so that's the first thing to, to say in relation to that. Um, there has been substantial amounts of money put into uh, voids in the last uh, year or two. Uh, so that's the current position. Uh, some of the, the, the um, you talking there about regeneration projects that are taking place uh, in the inner city and part of the regeneration project Re regeneration projects are to uh, re require 
that you detenant parts of the properties in order for them to be ready for demolition to build new, new units. I think you also know that the communities that are uh, we're talking about here, the regeneration communities, have suffered greatly over the last number of years, have had broken promises made in relation to their accommodation and indeed their general environment, etc., etc. Uh, what the City Council is doing in relation to uh, regeneration is honouring the, the, the promises that we have made to those, to those tenants and those communities. Uh, and it would be my view that we should continue to honour our promises to those communities and to uh, effect the regenerations as promised, admittedly, several, several years later than, than, uh, uh, than promised. But I think we must honour and keep our word in relation to those communities. Um, Carl, do you want to...? Yeah. Thanks, Dick. Uh, Deputy, in relation to the the allocations directive, so just for clarity, so the directive is a ministerial directive which is 50%, not just for homeless, but other vulnerable categories of households for Dublin region only. There are different numbers for other parts where the issue is acute. If you take last year, we have achieved uh, 1,059 tenancies. In other words, 1,059 households moved out of homeless services last year record achievement for homeless and housing services over that year. 87% of that 1,059 came from local authorities and approved housing bodies. That says a couple of things. One is that the local authorities are literally pulling out the stops to see can they actually assist with the tumultuous challenge that we're facing on a day-to-day basis in terms of um, households um, staying in, in, in homeless services. It would be the view and the concern of the local authorities that whilst that directive certainly gave us the uplift that we needed because we were in a crisis, that maybe we're at that tipping point now where perhaps there is a concern that it may be inducing. Um, I have to stress that the households that come to the local authorities for assistance are all low-income households. You're not talking about millionaires coming in the door who can provide for themselves. You're talking about very vulnerable households who need help. So there's a balance to be struck, and we feel that perhaps we're at a tipping point now, given there are such constraints in terms of the availability of property, that perhaps we need to, for a period of time, while, whilst we wait for supply, we may have to be asking people to look. We're not able to respond to you immediately. Um, you have to consider other alternatives whilst we wait for housing supply to kick in. So that concern has been raised. We know that the housing agency is carrying out a review of the directive, so all the stakeholders will be asked about what they think about the directive, and it will be really up to government or the minister or the department to decide where they go to prepare, but that will be the view of the local authorities. In relation to um, the concern around drug-free beds within the region and the issue of vulnerable persons who have very complex addiction needs, um, you're quite right, that's always an issue for us. I'd say two things about that. One is, if you take last year in Dublin alone, the local authorities and the homeless services provided accommodation by the end of the year to 5,480 adults. That's not including children. That's phenomenal. 38% of that cohort were never in homeless services before. That's phenomenal. Unheard of in my experience. If you take, for example, on the 31st of December, if you take even just like a census night, 2,279 adults, not including children, were in homeless services. We have increased our emergency capacity by about 70% since 2014. That says two things. One is we are at full occupancy and capacity. That is going to cause constraints around our ability to be able to match the right bed in the right service with the person to meet their needs. We do our best to do that, and I, I hope you'll appreciate that we try and work on that on a day-to-day -day basis. We have in the region of upwards of 300 beds that we would, would see as being drug and alcohol-free. Um, the staff that work in homeless services, I think, um, under extreme conditions, perform a most diligent professional job to the, best, to the very best of their ability. That includes local authority placement staff who are um, under extraordinary stress on a day-to-day -day basis, understandably so because they're dealing with and working with very vulnerable households. Likewise, our colleagues who are in state-funded NGO services are in the same position. 
The qualification and the standards required to work in the sector, um, we do have a competency-based framework under our HR framework where staff do have to have a basic level of accommodation. Most staff are trained in the area. We ourselves set up a unique, um, I think it's the first of its kind, with Dublin City University and the School of Mental Health Nursing and the Centre for Housing Research. We have, a, we have a training programme in place for the last two or three years where the majority of our staff actually have to go through a training programme as key workers to be able to work with difficult circumstances. It is a condition of service level agreements that where you have antisocial behaviour, um, it is the responsibility of the services to deal with the antisocial behaviour and to have in place good neighbourhood policies so that if it's affecting the neighbourhood that we um, do two things. One is either the person is transferred to an, an alternative facility to try and deal with the immediate issue or there is some level of sanction involved. But our sanctions can only go so far because fundamentally it usually involves a person who is quite vulnerable um, because they're in a treatment programme um, and they may be quite vulnerable or, or experiencing a level of chaos on a particular day. But that's something that we try to work with and ameliorate on a day-to-day basis. Thank you. There was just a, a question there, I think, about the difference in cost between the, the units. I just Maybe I should explain that. In 2014, we go back to this famous 2014, when we mentioned the possibility of using modular stroke rapid build housing, um, there was outcry across the country. Uh, everybody assumed that the, what we were talking about was, uh, were school prefabs that we all remembered as being uh, uh, disastrous places that we spent some, if not all, of our, our, our uh, youth in. Uh, I suppose in order to dispel some of those things, some of those views, uh, we set up, uh, with the industry in fairness, uh, a demonstration uh, project, which was there, and at the time it was clearly spoken, it was there to contribute to the debate in relation to the use of modular stroke rapid build housing. Six uh, 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 companies from the industry, uh, which I am very grateful to, came forward and said, yeah, we'll go and, and we'll, we'll take part in your demonstration. So we set aside a site on which we set up the demonstrated demonstration project in which to allow the general public, political people, everyone, to have a, 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 have a look at what might be possible in relation to modular or modular housing or rapid build housing, and to dispel some of the room or some of the what would you call it fears, if you like, in relation to the uh, the, the old school prefab view. The government had a look at that, and in fairness to the minister and indeed the Taoiseach and I think a lot of other politicians, they came out and they decided we're going to move forward with this. But we're going to move forward with this with a couple of stipulations, additional stipulations. One of those stipulations was that the lifespan had to be 60 years. Uh, I think the second stipulation that came, came out from that, that uh, um, advice note, if you like, is that the units must comply with all building uh, standards, all building standards. Uh, and the final um, thing in relation to the, uh, to the requirement, which is starting to slip from my mind at the minute, but the uh, final uh, sorry, requirement was that we couldn't use the name modular because there were other building techn technologies that could be brought to bear on the situation which um, might be just as good as, as a modular build. So, with that in mind, the tenders went out, and we are where we are. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, Deputy Catherine Byrne. Thanks, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for all the managers and uh, your other partners with them here. So thank you for the presentation, and uh, it was very informative. There's just a few questions, I suppose. Around the 2,542 houses still vacant, is that in the Dublin area, and how long will it be before they can be back, put back into use? And is there a cost, and do you have the money to do it? Just straight on, on that is that those figures don't re relate to <coughs> local authority houses. They don't. Do they don't. Know? Okay. Uh, sorry, the Chairman, if I could have you just comment on those. Well. Yeah. Uh, there are quite a number of unfinished estates right around the country, and in areas that there's no need, unfortunately. And uh, some of these houses, it's sad to see them in a derelict state, empty, 
Um, but there's no, there's no need, there, there is no uh, demonstrated need for them. And, uh, but having said that, all local authorities and Monday, <coughs> Easter Mondays have been made available to try and bring them back into use so that we will have them there available at some stage uh, when the need is, is generated. It is a, still a significant issue to be addressed by all. And again, uh, Chairman, it's something that we have to pick up. You know, it's, that's not something we didn't build these houses, but we will finish them off. Anything further, Deputy? Thanks. Yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah Sorry, John. On. Yes. Sorry. Just, just around. I suppose just. To, I suppose to pay some kind of a tribute as well to the City Council and the work they've done in regeneration of Michael's estate and family mansions and trees as gardens and Dolphin House in my own area and the amount of people that they've had to re rehouse because people's homes were be taken off them so they were priority and I understand that very well and I just want to pay a compliment on that because I think. Great work has been done in all of those complexes and continuing to be done in Dolphin House to move people around. Just on the public-private partnership, the 500 homes, are they all going to be, the, where do you, I don't mind what you call them, um, quick fix houses, timber houses, it doesn't really matter, are they all social housing units? My understanding is in relation to that, those, that 500 units are contained in the social housing strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the, as, you, as you know, the PPP uh, is uh, set up uh, to deliver them. They will, as in my understanding, be all social houses. So 500 social houses. Uh, they need necessarily be, uh, uh, what would you call it, rapid build. They could be traditional build. Uh, there is a, a process uh, about to start or has started in relation to, uh, uh, in relation to the uh, procurement of, uh, of those units. Thanks. Uh, just um, cattle on the homeless one, just on the 5,811 uh, homeless, uh, how many of them are actually family units? I think you said there's a, there's a number of the adults and the children. I can't remember the exact figures. They're here somewhere. But how many of them are actually family units? I think you said there was 5,811 and 1,800 of them are, are, are children and yours are adults. But actually many of them are actually family units, yeah. Three thousand nine hundred. Yeah, just just to clarify, what I was giving was the end of year total amount of placements in 2015. Okay. So the local authorities placed 5,480 adults, individuals. Okay? okay. Now obviously there are family cohorts within that. Okay. Yeah. But that's the total amount of individuals that were occupied in the emergency bed throughout the year. Throughout okay? the year. So just to take it a step further. Okay. So that's the total amount. So just keep in mind, lots of households come into homeless services. Yeah and move on for different reasons, either into tenancies, back home, um, or into treatment. So it's very dynamic. There's a huge churn within homeless services. Now, if you take one night, let's say the 31st of December um, 2015, we had 2,279 adults in homeless services. If you take families, so if you just take the adults who are within that who are families and their child dependents, okay, so at the moment we have 790 families in emergency accommodation and within that they have 1,616 child dependents. Now the kind of accommodation that we're providing in order to avoid the need to sleep rough, okay, we don't want to be doing it but we don't want families to be on streets, ranges between commercial hotel settings. So so within that 700, sorry about all the stats here, but this is all available on homelessdublin.ie if anyone wants to see it. Of the 790, 581 of those families are in commercial hotel settings. And by the way, are getting support from homeless action teams with a view to trying to, to help families to move on. 209 of those families, so the remainder, are in what we call supported lodgings. In other words, they are supported temporary accommodation where we have staff on site. Okay. So that's that's how the, the figures figures break out. Just just to Billy, uh, something you said there, which uh, City Council I believe in the past done very well, was build really nice senior citizen complex, and I know we have as well. And is there any plans at all 
we're in the councils to start building more senior citizens because there are a lot of people who are living in houses that really basically have uh, don't suit their needs anymore and would be willing to move into smaller accommodation particularly if it was well built and I could name loads of complexes but there's no need to uh, under some kind of financial contribution because I think that was the way to go and is there any further plans to do that because that would alleviate family homes then back into the market. And just, I'll just finish the questions and then maybe Mike could slip back. On the arrears, that, the figures of the 5,221 uh, people in arrears, is there any idea of how much that proxy is? Is it thousands? Is it millions? Uh, and Cahill, is there a homeless bill? Can you give us some kind of a figure what you're spending at the moment? And just on the last one, I suppose for me, um, the cost of the voids and how much they're costing to put back into... Um, into use because that's a big issue with a lot of people and just on the last thing and I think Maureen raised it as well just around the people who are on the housing list and particularly people who have been on it for maybe 12 and 13 years and the accommodation that they've been living in doesn't suit the size of their family now because their family have got older whatever chance will they now have of being housed because they seem to be going further down the list rather than up the list because of all the other uh, people coming onto the list so if you can answer some of them thanks yeah, uh, just to come back, um, yes, absolutely. We, I'll, t I'll speak for South Dublin. Um, we are preparing um, a big proposal to come to the department with, um, and I suppose that emanates really from the shock um, of you know the number of people that are living alone in larger units when we have a family need. Um, we, we're working on a brief on that at the moment. It's nothing new, you know, as you, as you say, quite rightly, Deputy, there are uh, already projects there already, uh, good examples. Um, and also, Age Friendly Alliance uh, have worked with Loud County Council, I think, on, on the Slitter Programme and the Great Northern Haven. So there are good examples there that can, that can be um, copied. Chairman, the issue of rears, there's a significant, I don't have the exact figure, but we can get that for you. But um, it's a significant amount of money that's uh, involved, obviously, with the arrears, and it's something that we're very conscious of as well. It's another cohort of potential um, issues coming down the line for us. Um, the homelessness. Yep. Thanks. Um, on expenditure, by the end of 2015, we had expended just over 70 million on homeless and housing support services. So 48 of, just over 48 million of that came from the central exchequer, so that's the, the um, Section 10 funding that comes to the Dublin local authorities. The balance is made up between um, the contribution that is made from the local authorities. Okay? So just to be clear, that is expenditure that's related to the, to the local authorities only. So obviously the health service expend, I think it's in the region of 15 million or thereabouts yeah, for the care side. Okay? So a couple of other things I think to clarify, often people make the assumption that's all spent on emergency and substantial amount is, well over 40% is spent on emergency between hotels, between supported accommodation and the private emergency accommodation settings that we have. But just to give you an example of what we spend in other areas, because this is often missed, if you take that expenditure, we, we spend 4.5 million on tenancy sustainment and resettlement services. On long-term supported accommodation, so we have accommodation in the region that's made available to households who are deemed and assessed as not being able to live independent lives with, even with visiting supports. So in other words, you've got staff on a 24-hour basis working with the tenants to assist them in their day-to-day -day lives. So if you look at long-term supported accommodation, we spent just over $6 million last year. If you look at day services, okay, so this is... Um, Service, these are services that provide um, food, information, advice, everything ranging from Threshold right through to Brother Kevin's, um, Merchants Key, uh, Focus Ireland. We spent uh, 4.3 million. So there are different categories of services that the local authorities fund in order to do different things, ranging from prevention through to emergency responses through to assisting households back into tenancies with support. Chairman, can I add? Yes. Um, that I think it's an important point to make today that not everyone on the housing list, especially in the rural counties, wants a social house. There are people on the social housing list, on the housing list that are there for many reasons, and there are a significant number of people who are on the list and perfectly happy.
to be in and remain in private rented accommodation. Uh, Deputy Wallace. Thank you, and thank you for coming in. Um, just to start with, uh, a, f a, few, uh, um, a few points on your opening contribution, and it touches on your last point. Uh, you say both social housing and private housing clients are competing for the same limited supply. Do you agree that this is directly linked to the fact that we've been using private housing uh, to satisfy the demand for social housing and, uh, to the, and using the rent supplement scheme as the state has been doing? Uh, secondly, um, you say we need to make every aspect of housing provision more affordable, and obviously and you, you refer immediately to the cost of, of land. Uh, does the local authority have powers to engage in compulsory purchase. Um, I just, you might just fill us in on that. Uh, the third point, um, you say that the financial services market have an obligation to be part of the solution and make credit available. Now, uh, I don't think the state is very good at telling the private banks what to do, and it's probably not going to start now. Uh, do you not think that the state should be seriously borrowing money itself in order to uh, find the money to do this? Uh, my next point, uh, you say uh, we need to create an environment where quality developers and builders have the opportunity to share their experience and skills in building sustainable and quality homes for our citizens. I'm just wondering how do you assess uh, what's a quality builder? And I wonder as well if uh, you're actually over-concentrated on the big developer and going for the big bang effect, uh, there's an awful lot of small sites uh, in, the, in city and country. and. Uh, I, I can't help feeling that they're not being targeted near as much, and there's plenty of, of very small builders in the country that are well able to build. Uh, next point, uh, you talk about the new tenant purchase scheme as if it's something very positive. There was some recent research in Britain uh, which showed that over the last 30 years uh, that the scheme hasn't really worked at all, and that 40% of the units that were sold through this scheme First of all, they weren't replaced, so stock was reduced. And secondly, 40% of them ended up in the hands of landlords who were renting them back to tenants again, at which and the state was actually uh, supplementing the rent, uh, and they were back to state, stage one. Uh, and the last one from your contribution, uh, you say that... Um, uh, that unless the private sector returns to building properties immediately, the problem, including homelessness, is going to get worse. Now, uh, yes, of course it would be good uh, if they would help things if they return to the market, but uh, do you not agree that uh, in the last uh, six, seven years plus that uh, the state sector has actually been waiting all that time for the private sector uh, to get involved. The philosophy seems to have been that, oh, should the markets have sorted out? Well, sadly, the markets haven't sorted it out, and we need the state to get back into building and providing houses. And just my other couple of points then that I wanted to ask about. Uh, you might be able to tell me how much social housing has been delivered in the Docklands area since 2008. Uh, Secondly, uh, there's an, a lot of high-end commercial being built down there, and uh, does the local authority have the wherewithal to insist on residential rather than commercial in order to help alleviate our housing crisis in areas like this? Uh, thirdly, uh, uh, could you just fill me in on just why uh, Devony Gardens hasn't progressed? Uh, What's the plan for it, and uh, what do you expect to happen in that, uh, with it in the near future? Um, uh, it was mentioned about, you agree that uh, local authorities sh uh, shouldn't be building 100% social on any sites, and I agree 100% with you because I think we agree that it creates ghettoisation and the, the social problems to go with it. So can you tell me, is there any plans to put 100% social on any sites in Dublin City in the near future? And lastly, uh, just the, uh, we were talking earlier about procurement uh, challenges, um, and uh, I'm fairly well aware of how long it takes uh, to make all this happen. Uh, I did a bit of building in my time, and uh, I know some of the, plenty of the challenges involved, but I'd like you to, uh, to tell me, do you think the local authorities are understaffed? 
Thank you, Deputy Wallace. Just before you answer the question, there were a number of specific questions answered. If the information isn't readily available in terms of numbers that you asked, could you forward that to the committee for Deputy Wallace uh, rather than... Of course, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, maybe just to deal with some of the questions, and I'll, I'll invite my colleagues then in to deal with the rest insofar as we can and the information we have. Just in terms in, in relation to the, the private rental and... Uh, the economy, as we all know, has improved significantly and there are a lot of people returning immigrants uh, back into the country, thankfully, and they're competing uh, for properties, to rent properties. And indeed, uh, people who were in a position to save for and buy their own properties in the past, uh, because of affordability and income, they are now not in a position to save and to buy properties. So they are also competing for the properties that heretofore were used for uh, social leasing. So the, the problem is uh, exacerbated by the fact that you have, uh, for the limited number of properties that are there, there are people who heretofore would be looking for them, but also new people who are coming back, the returning immigrants, and also people who cannot afford to buy their own properties, but are still working, sometimes both partners working, and they, they, are, they are forced to rent as well because of affordability issue. In relation to um, state borrowing and why wouldn't the government get back into borrowing, um, uh, this is why uh, it's so important that they have approved housing bodies because um, they, they can borrow. Um, in relation to government borrowing uh, for, 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 for housing, it, it's, it's regarded as on balance sheet and there are restrictions there. And, uh, Mr. Brady, he, he, he referred to those. In re relation to quality builders, yes, I agree with you entirely. Um, it's not down to the big developers, and we all are aware of uh, small quality builders. And in fact, maybe the best properties are built by, by, by small, smaller builders. And uh, what I mean by quality builders is people who adhere to their planning permission, the building card, according to the building regulations, have correct certification, correct supervision, and sign off on it. And uh, in relation to, and I'll let my colleagues come in then, in relation to 100% build out versus 10 or 15%, it depends on the site and the context of the site. So, for instance, a small site, infill site in Dublin City, for instance, could be built out 100% because of the broader context and the broader mix of the properties in the general area. Whereas uh, a similar site, we'll say, for instance, in a town where there is a need, you wouldn't build it all out because you wouldn't have the tenure, the mixed tenure in the broader area and you might be leading to the problems that you have mentioned there yourself. So, um, can you come in yeah, there? I suppose just to, I suppose to add on that, you, you are actually talking about scale, uh, Deputy Wallace, if, if, in terms of uh, tenure mix uh, and, and, and so forth. If you were building 700 houses, you might have a, a, an issue in relation to uh, tenure mix, but if you were building smaller numbers or acquiring smaller numbers of houses, that might not be the... Uh, that might be that not might be the, the case. The other thing too is, I suppose, um, and we need to carry out some research. I suppose in relation to some of this, uh, it's assumed that a social tenant are all social tenants, and I, I don't assume. By the way, it's assumed that they have certain characteristics which lend them towards. Uh, uh, what would you call it, antisocial activity and, and also uh, lends them to, uh, what would you call it, uh, the, the, the bad parts of ghettoization. But from my experience, and I've been involved in housing for a long time, the vast majority of families and individuals that come to us for uh, service are decent people trying to get from A to a Z uh, the same way as every as every other, uh, as every other family, uh, and I think that the, uh, you know, that what we're looking at really in terms of ensuring that we have the best quality estates, we're looking at more than just house building. We're looking at the services that families need to be in place when you, uh, when you house them. So, in other words, you need to have the health systems. You need to have the schools. Uh, you know, you need to have the shops. You know, some of our greatest failures, if you look at in the past, have been uh, us building large numbers of houses on the sides of hills, uh, you know, on the suburbs of Dublin, without having the social and other infrastructure necessary to support family life. Uh, so the, the question of 
of ghettoisation is a bigger one than, than simply a question of numbers, and it needs to be looked at in, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that way. In relation to O'Devney Gardens, I mentioned to earlier that we had three possibilities or three sites that we were looking at in terms of bringing forward with innovative ideas in order to have them developed in the way that I spoke that would have uh, social units, that will have uh, purchase units, and that will have, I hope, uh, I hope uh, we, we get to the stage that we can carry out the necessary uh, work in relation to affordable, uh, affordable renting, because I believe there's a sector of, of, of our population out there that are suffering at the moment because they don't have choices in that, that particular area. So we will be bringing those proposals forward to our, our, our council in relation to that. Uh, and we will be bringing them uh, sort of within the next month or so. They're being worked on uh, at the moment. Um, do you ask specific questions in, in, in uh, relation to Docklands? The numbers I don't have. Um, we'll forward, forward them to the Secretariat we'll and we'll pass them out directly. And, uh, my last question about being understaffed. Again, oh, sorry, do you want to? Yeah. Um, we came from a position where we stopped building some years ago and we were, we, we were leasing properties and buying the properties that were built for us. Um, and all of the housing units across the country were, were you know, they, they were shrunk in terms of the number of people that were there. Um, last year, uh, all local authorities that wanted additional staff were allowed to have additional staff. And it is my belief that at this point in time, we have sufficient resources, but as, um, as we gear up to uh, meet the demand of the private sector, to plan with them, to coordinate them, to help them, and other stakeholders, uh, we may need and probably will need additional resources. But at this point in time, um, I'm satisfied that resources is not an inhibitor to the delivery of housing units and social housing units at this very point in time. Thank you. Deputy Function. Answer. Sorry, just can I remind him of two questions I didn't answer. I'm not inventing new ones. Uh, the one about compulsory purchase, uh, whether you had that power, yeah. and uh, also about the docklands. Uh, there's, a, there's obviously uh, uh, some of the, the, the foreign investment funds have obviously bought a lot of land down there, and they're eager to put a high end office as our NAMA. Uh, do you have the right, the wherewithal, to actually insist on more residential uh, if they come looking for a high-end office. Just in relation to the uh, chairman, in relation to the uh, lands, um, we have sufficient lands at the moment to build out. Um, so the, the availability of land is not an immediate problem. And in relation to using our CPO powers, um, we don't need to exercise them at this point in time. Um, the, the Docklands issue. Is, I suppose so, uh, the Docklands issue. Uh, uh, Docklands has an SDZ, so it has a, a full planning scheme in relation to its uh, its development, and it would be developed in accordance with the planning scheme and in accordance with the, the planning uh, permission. So, if if proposals come in that are in accordance with the planning the planning scheme, uh, I assume that they will will get permission. Now that. I assume that's the, that will be the position in relation to uh, in relation to uh, Docklands. Thank, thank you. Is Mr. Cohen saying there's enough land in all the local authorities for housing? Or were you referring just to the Docklands? Can you clarify that? I, you I, said we've enough to build out. I, I wasn't referring to the Docklands. Uh, general, general. Because that is blatantly not but, the case Deb in Fingal, Deb for example. Deputy, in Deb Deputy Coppinger, we can come back to you in a moment. I still well, how, well, it's just a very important statement. We can, we can come back to you. I want the other people who have, who have to be fair, offered to make contributions. I want to afford no, them I an, know, yeah. an, an just... opportunity. Deputy Function, you're next. Then, then Deputy Function, Deputy Butler, Deputy Ryan, and then... Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks as well to the speakers for coming in. I just, I have to start off by saying I completely disagree with the statement that there are some people who are happy enough to stay on the list and get rent supplement. I represent very rural and urban constituency. It's two counties, Cardinal and Kilkenny, and in the seven years of being a councillor, I've never met one person that wants to stay on the list and is happy enough to get rent supplement. I just want to make that point. 
Um, the questions I have, a lot of them have been addressed, but um, particularly seeing as the point was made that there's sufficient resources, I'm just wondering about delays, and I'm not just talking about in relation to building social housing. In some, in some areas we do have land, but I'm talking also about in relation to buying social housing. There's a huge delay, I mean, it's taken like six, seven, eight months sometimes when, when local authorities are buying houses for people. And I'm just wondering what the delay is. If there, I would have thought it was a resource issue um, of, uh, in terms of staff, because I do know over the last number of years with embargoes that staff have been stretched. But if you're saying there's sufficient resources, then how, if a local authority goes out and buys a house, is it taking them something like six to eight months for that house? And it's not a house that needs to be done up or any works need to be done to. It's, it's in perfect condition, so what's the delay there? Um, the mortgage to rent as well, I'm just wondering what you see as obstacles to that because I know an awful lot of people and I'm sure everyone would agree they, they would know a lot of people that would, that would be perfect applicants for that but yet they don't seem to qualify um, and a lot of the problem seems to be, it comes back saying the house is, it could be a standard three bedroom house but it might just be a couple living there, the family have moved out and, and they're being told your house is, is you're sort of over accommodated so you can't fall into the mortgage to rent scheme Things like that, I mean, that's a real, there's a lot of common sense there. My phones again, sorry. <coughs> um, I mean, you have people who are going through the system of going into court, their case being adjourned, put back, put back in relation to eviction, they have the stress and the worry of that, and yet they could be perfect applicants for mortgage to rent, but it's something silly like, oh, you have an extra bedroom. And the reality is they don't because they, you know, families grow up, but families always return home with grandkids and everything. So. There's, we need to kind of start thinking outside the box, I think, and, and that brings me to the other point in relation to voids. Um, what used to come up and still comes up regularly with people, <coughs> I'm not talking about where there's major work to be done, but where there's small work to be done, where people might have the ability themselves or within family and friends to do those works themselves, and they're saying, I can take the house as is. Why can't something like that be looked at? And I'm not talking about big works where you're going to saddle somebody with a big debt, but if there was some sort of a system, if it is going to take a local authority a long time to turn over a house, let the person do that and then come up with some sort of a, an agreement maybe in relation to rent, that they have the first one or two months rent, you know, free in the, in the house. Like, I, we need to start thinking of things like that, that they mightn't actually fit into any particular category or box, but they're... they're common sense things, and people say that all the time, they'll take the house as is, they have family or friends that can help them bring it up to standard, and they're a lot of the time minor works. So just, I think we, we need to be thinking about things like that, and I'd like to see what the opinions of yourselves are in relation to things like that, and how we kind of cut out some of the red tape, particularly at the way things are at the moment, uh, to try and speed, speed up the whole system. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Uh, Cummins? Maybe Mr. If I sort of deal with the, the first issue, the, the, the length of time it takes to purchase a house. Now, I think if anybody who is engaged in purchasing a, a house uh, will know that the conveyancing process can be torturous and it can be long. So an awful lot of the delays in relation to uh, the acquisition or the purchase of, of housing units uh, is down basically to the, the, the conveyancing position and all of the, the, the hurls and the, the, what would you call it, the jumps, etc., etc., that one has to go through in order to get clear title, etc., 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 exchanging contracts and, and, and everything else. So a good deal of the delay is down to, um, as I say, the, the con conveyancing uh, process. And I think anybody who bought a house will know that it can be a, a difficult and uh, trying, uh, trying time. Uh, in relation to, uh, I suppose, the small works idea, I think that idea has been used and is being used. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, in relation to painting, uh, the internal painting of, uh, of social housing, I know that the City Council scheme allows for uh, a tenant to take a, uh, what would you call it, to take a, a uh, take the house and paint the house internally to their own liking because I think we have found that generally speaking in any event when somebody walks into a house, a social house that they have been allocated, probably one of the first things they do is get a paintbrush 
and paint the internals to their, their own liking. So there is a scheme within the city council that uh, allows that. So, so that's the first thing. There are other issues in relation to sort of other works within the house, uh, which sort of, uh, I suppose, the, the, the mad world that we live in, an awful lot of things uh, um, sort of end up actionable, or if something happens, or you know, further on up the road, you end up with um, uh, difficulties. Uh, difficulties uh, there. So there are works that can be done, there are works that should be done, and interestingly, in relation to some of this, some people do not want to avail of the, uh, the possibility of getting an allowance to paint their own, uh, their own house. But as I say, it's there, uh, and I think there are other things we could be doing. Uh, like what you say, as I say, common sense things uh, that can uh, push things. Uh, Just the mortgage uh, rent, Chairman. Yes. Yeah, I, I suppose it's fair. I, sh I should start by saying that uh, no local authority sets out to make anybody homeless. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's about people keeping keeping people in their in their homes. When you talk about mortgage to rent, there are two schemes. There's the general mortgage to rent one, which you're dealing with financial institutions, and can be <coughs> difficult with many of those financial institutions to engage with them. Um, certainly, it's a difficult process. Uh, I think it should be, there are options to simplify it somewhat and streamline it a bit more. And equally for the local authority men, uh, mortgage to rent, that's the local authority loans, um, you know, the, the, there could be some work done in those as, on, on that system. But remember on the LA MTR, and certainly it's our experience, my experience, that it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. And very often people don't take that option because it is effectively you know, giving up home ownership to rent instead. And, and, but certainly there can be some work done on the processes themselves to make it, simplify them. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Deputy uh, Butler. Uh, Butler. Here, Doc. Um, I would also like to thank the members of the County and City Management for being here today. I feel it was very informative. Um, Obviously, a huge amount of the time has been given over to discussing issues in Dublin, and I have no problem with that because it's where the need is greatest. And I was just wondering, have you, have you looked at, say, um, families that have the greatest need in Dublin, have you considered that if they were favourable to it, maybe moving out to more rural areas where the demand is less? That's just, just one question. Now, the other few issues I want to deal with are basically, you know, I'm from the... the from Waterford, so I represent Waterford City and County, so I have an urban rural divide. And in relation to, the, it's kind of a local authority question. Um, do the local authorities, um, is, is it a rule of thumb that the, the local authorities, you know, each particular area or county can make up their mind in relation to, say, purchasing private houses? I'm talking about um, council estates that might have been built 20 or 30 years ago and, and, and um, residents may have purchased their house over a time and now they're up for sale and I'm talking about houses that could be three bed semi D's that could you know um, or, or bungalow style that are now maybe for sale at 95,000 or 100,000 much cheaper than trying to turn over a sod um, you know in the Waterford area we're only inclined to buy them if people present with health issues we're not inclined to buy them, you know, just to kind of increase our stock of houses. Um, another question, would there be a merit in, I'm, I'm talking, say, for example, people, um, a, a mother maybe with three or four kids in a two-bed house, would there be a merit in putting an extension onto that house as against um, waiting maybe two years until a tree bed becomes available for her. I think it would be a much. I think it would be a much quicker fix. That if we, were, it's another thing we don't do. Um, we do it for medical issues, but not so much anymore. For you know, for for people that they can stay in their own house. They're living in a nice house. They're living in, living in a nice area. They may be there ten years. Their family, their family circumstances have changed. They need an extra room. They need an extra bathroom. Um, would there be merit in looking at that? I'm trying to look at solutions here that might be quicker fix than trying to, to, to build whole estates. Now I know it might only sort out six or seven families in an area but it, it, may, be, it may make a big difference. Also the other point I wanted to make in relation to HAP, I've seen HAP work very very well but the problem for example say in the, in the south of the country um, the rent supplement is 525 euro in Waterford. It's 590, I think, in Kilkenny. You know, you go over the border to Cork, it's 750. 
it's very, very difficult for people to get um, to, to get houses for 524 five euro. The average is 650 to 700 in that area. And what happens is you have people on very low incomes trying to supplement the extra 125, <coughs> the extra 150 out of their pockets. The landlords, I, I feel, um, are in a win-win situation because their money is secure. But it's very, very hard to get the landlords to sign up because a lot of the renting is going on um, not above board. You know, so there are just a few issues that I, I there were more questions that you've answered already, so there's no point in me repeating them. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. Coleman. Yeah, I'll deal, I'll deal first in relation to the, the HAP. Um, look, it's, it's different in some areas where it's difficult to, to get at the rent caps that are there. There have been allowances made to local authorities to get a percentage above what that cap is to facilitate case by case basis. I do know, and I'm certainly not here to speak for the department, but I do know that they are evaluating right across the country, and certainly I'm sure Waterford will be part of that review, and to see what assistance is needed there, and if what is applicable in Dublin and some other areas yeah, may be of value there as well. So it is just to advise you that it is something that is being looked at. Thank you. And Chairman, uh, to come in as well, um, I suppose the point we're making here today is that the availability, there's an availability issue out there and Waterford has a particular problem. In your relation to your points about if there's a three bed or you know house available and it's cheaper, 90,000, whatever, less maybe, uh, provided there's a need, yeah. you know, so there are two things, provided there's a need and providing it's not upsetting the, so, the tenure, the, so, the mix, so, and, you know, so we have to be very careful there. And, but there is a mechanism, and the department would, are quite willing to support us in that if there are properties that are good value and there is a need and the tenure of mix is, is correct. In relation to the very valid point you made about maybe building on, yeah, I, that's a very good point. And there is an anomaly there, and we're working on that because if there's a medical issue, you know, so we're aware of that, and has, it has, so we're looking at, into that at the, at, at the moment. And thanks for that. Yeah. Deputy Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, in relation to the, the new streamlined process you refer to in terms of delivering social housing units, 15 units, less than 2 million, can you kind of expand on that and tell us what that's delivering and uh, the potential of it? Uh, public, the public-private uh, situation delivering 500 houses, what's the lead time on that? And uh, are there any more in the pipeline? Uh, in terms of p the homeless uh, units kind of putting people in, in hotels and, and guest houses, etc., um, is there any flexibility there for, for people in that situation to find kind of solutions for themselves? For example, somebody becomes homeless in Rush and there's a proposal to put them in a hotel up at the airport. Like it would seem that it would, if they could find something local, it would you know, be more satisfactory for those people. Um, and you outlined also in your paper the legislative policy development, which kind of is, is a context for uh, for what have you, a lot of what you had to say. But look, in terms of your delivery uh, of of units, etc., is there any legislative barrier, you know, there that's preventing you from delivering, or is there anything you would do tomorrow by way of legislation which would help you do your job uh, better? Uh, in terms of uh, you know, Fingal, Mr. Brady would know uh, Fingal from all, but it used to be a, a scheme in place there where the, the local authority would provide service sites to people, to young couples there who, could, who would be anxious to build their own houses and could do so if they got a reasonable site. Is there, is there any legislation required for you to do that or is that something you could roll out yourselves? <coughs> and finally, in relation to uh, your commentary in relation to the threshold community welfare officer, the flexibility around that in terms of increasing rent supplement or HAP uh, to reflect market conditions. It's my experience in Fingal that that is working very much on a case-by-case -case basis. But a lot of people I talk to, you know, around the housing, uh, you know, the uh, bodies and that would say, look, it's not generally working across Dublin. So. What's your, what's your sense of that? I mean, if it's not working, if it's working in some parts of Fingal, why is it not uh, working elsewhere? Now, I'm not referring to areas where there might be a receiver, but in, in, a, in a normal situation. 
and given uh, you know that it might be working on a case by case basis, is there justification for increasing the rent caps across the board in your view? I, can I come in there? I it, it, it's, it's a question that, that, that we, we deal with on a continuous basis and uh, I suppose one of the points that I made in the presentation there that when I said that caution is needed in, in helping owners with mortgage repayments or renters with rent and um, because it's such a tight supply and demand market at the moment, uh, if we interfere in the market we'll make it worse and we'll drive up rents uh, across the country and we'll actually make it worse. So we wouldn't be in favour of a broad increase for that reason because it would make it worse for a broader reach of people. And again, the landlords, and you know, they, they would be the winners and the potential tenants would be the losers. And uh, there is a targeted approach and it has success, but it's just specifically targeted, and Carl might come in on that later on, it's specifically targeted where people are in danger of becoming homeless. And that was the primary reason it was introduced and has worked very successfully. In terms of you know, legislative uh, what interventions that might be made, one of the problems that we have as local authorities is that, and, and, and again with all due respect to all the tenants of evidence, you know, they, they work as we do to the legislation that's there. But it's very frustrating for us as local authority and housing authorities that when we make a house available to someone, um, or they say we don't want it there because it's not, it's not where we want it. And the whole area of choice, you would, one would imagine that if you know, people in their need to have a house and a home would take a house and a home anywhere within reason, but certainly within the county. And that's a huge issue in terms of refusal after refusal. And one of the reasons that sometimes it's so long to rent a property, to let a property, is you go through the process you go through, and then it's, oh, we don't want it. And you have to go through it all again and this council re 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 refusal. It's a huge problem for us. So, and indeed, as, as, as people have, some of, the, some of the members here today have said, you know, why, why would it not be the case that someone, if, if there wasn't a house available in Dublin, that they might come down to Roscommon? Uh, but again, easier said than done, and uh, there are very complex reasons why they don't do that. So, but there, there is cer certainly something that might be done in terms of the choice, as people, to limiting the choices, maybe to the county rather than have, in some instances, in, um, in, in, in Galway, I know when I, I worked there, there was people had a multiplicity of choices, you know, and uh, that didn't help things. So um, maybe, Carl, you might come yeah. back in terms of the, the homeless. Just uh, before Carl comes in there, you, you've asked questions, in, in essence, about small builders and service uh, sites. You know quite well that that works extremely well for, and it has done in, in the past in relation to providing uh, accommodation for a certain cohort of the population. It never delivered sort of major numbers, but it, it, it delivered fairly significant projects in, uh, well, Donabate would be one that would be, I'm sure you, you, you would know about. So it delivered significant projects for particular areas. Uh, I don't believe that there's any great great barrier to, uh, to us uh, moving in, in, in those directions again, and that maybe some small builders stroke service sites, stroke uh, cooperative, local cooperative type um, um, uh, developments might be facilitated in some of the other plans that we have for, for, uh, uh, for housing. But it, it has worked well in the past, and it, it has been extremely beneficial for certain, um, for certain communities. Mr. Morgan. Sure, can I just clarify what time we're going on until? Six o'clock. Six, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the Deputy, the Tenancy Protection Service started in June 2014. So that's an initiative where by threshold work with ourselves and the Department of Social Protection around um, vulnerable households who are in receipt of rent supplement who are possibly going to lose their tenancy as a result of income inadequacy. So they have had since June 2014 7,500 direct contacts from tenants within the private rental sector. Out of that 7,500, they have deemed, this is threshold, not us, have deemed that approximately 3,700 were at immediate risk of losing their tenancies. And within that number, since um, this, this scheme began, 1,600 have had the uplifts. Um, only of, of the, of the, this is important why I'm raising this. 22 out of the 7,500 came into homeless services. That's 22 households out of that number. We would make a couple of points in relation to this particular scheme. We do think, and Threshold would say this, that 
we probably need to keep doing more of the awareness raising campaign piece because often it can just be too late against the, again the household reaches us. In other words, it, quite often there is a receivership problem. Um, often there is a, a legal reason which allows the tenancy to be relinquished, unfortunately. Um, so there's nothing that can be done. Um, and then we have to move in with an emergency intervention. Um, the Department of Social Protection would have to answer for themselves in relation to the operation of the scheme generally, but they have made the point um, within our own structures that they do regular um, um, mail shots and make contact with those in receipt of rent supplement to try and make people aware that if you're in trouble, please do come to us at the earliest possible opportunity. 